Thank you, Angela. I, it's a great pleasure to um, be back in the law faculty and an honor to have been invited to contribute to this conference. I haven't written a formal paper because I thought it was an, an occasion when it might be more appropriate to chat informally, but to remind, really to remind myself about what we all got up to um, in that now quite distant period, I put together um, the background paper which I circulated. I hope you all have a copy. I did that like Bill Cornish with the help of Felicity and I was quite impressed um, by the amount that we seemed to have been able to do. Um, I was certainly most grateful for her help because um, I didn't, that there were quite a number of things um, that, that I'd forgotten about. So I'm going to um, run through that background paper just to give an idea of the range of activities during the period of my um, directorship of cells, and then go on to make the connection between cells activities and developments in the European Union and in EU law. Starting if then with um, the details on my background paper, as Bill has told you already, I started as director in the Michaelmas term of 1994, which was before I took up my chair formally um, in January uh, 1995. I had to, I'd been uh, the member of the council's legal service with responsibility for the legal side of the enlargement that was taking place on the 1st of January 1994, bringing in uh, Austria, Sweden, and Finland as member states. And I had to stay on in Brussels to see that through. But I did have an opportunity um, during the summer of that year to begin planning a, a, a program for cells which I, I largely did actually on a fishing holiday in, in Scotland, um, which, which became the, um, the seminar series uh, reviewing Maastricht. Uh, the main activity of cells during 1995. I should just mention the members of um, the cell staff with whom I was privilege to work. Um, there were four assistant or deputy directors. At some point, I decided it was that we ought to change the title to deputy director because I didn't want the impression to be given that the person holding that post was my assistant. Um, it was a proper deputy's post. Um, the, the first holder of it during my time was uh, Natalie Prouvier, Prouvier, who had been appointed by Bill. Um, she was succeeded by Shifra O'Leary in 95 to 96. Perhaps not a very good commentary on my um, directorship that I should have lost two <laughs> assistant directors in the space of two years. But fortunately then Angela Ward arrived and um, she stayed until it was almost time for me to move on when she was succeeded in 2000 by Christophe Illion. I was extremely fortunate in, in, in uh, being uh, assisted by all of those colleagues, and I'm, and I'm immensely grateful to them, as I am to the administrative assistants. Um, Veronica Kendall, who uh, held that post from 1994 to 1999, and Diane Abraham, who took it over 
in that year. Sills was rather well provided um, at that time with um, resources, at, at least in the sense of, of, of human resources, but also financially, because thanks to Bill's efforts, I'm sure, he was too modest to mention, um, the Sills had a, a substantial endowment from Foreign and Colonial Management uh, Limited and, uh, Mr. Uh, and a personal gift from uh, Oliver Dawson. And that, that enabled us to uh, undertake quite a large, qu quite an ambitious uh, program of uh, conferences and seminars. I can't claim that I arrived in cells with a five-year plan, but I did have some broad aims. First, to use cells in order to raise the profile of EU law within the university, um, and indeed within the faculty. The profile of the subject was certainly rising at the time, and um, Bill has mentioned um, the, uh, the support that um, the subject and, uh, and that the center was, was, was receiving from the faculty, but it still had a way to go. So that was my, my first objective. Uh, a second was to establish SILV as an internationally recognized center for uh, center of excellence for the academic study of EU law. We were late in the field. There were well-established centers at Edinburgh, at Exeter, and at King's College London. So I, and, and I, so I felt we, we, we needed to, to, to make an effort to um, establish ourselves in the front rank. And thirdly, to use the modern, a, a modern buzzword, which I wouldn't have used at the time, um, I wanted the work of self to have impact. Um, I wanted it to have a, a real influence on those making or applying EU law um, as legislators, judges, practitioners, uh, or administrators. Partly by shoving our work under their noses, by sending, sending our publications to them, but also by involving them in it, by getting them to come here and participate. So anyway, that, those were the, broadly my aims. And you'll have noticed that there was a strong focus on EU law. Um, now, Sills' remit, as Bill pointed out, was much broader. Um, to promote the teaching, to, to promote teaching and research in the laws of European states, comparative legal studies relating to Europe, the law of the European communities, and the law of other European institutions and organizations. Now, I felt that that was too wide a remit to fulfill um, satisfactorily. Um, and I got into a bit of trouble with the faculty board um, for making that decision. But I, had, I was thankful to have the support of the then chairman of the board, Professor Spencer. And um, so during my, during my tenure of the directorship, the main focus was on EU law, though that doesn't mean that we, that we neglected um, comparative law. We were always open, always willing and able to collaborate with colleagues in the faculty on activities in that field or in, in, in other fields where their specialisms overlapped with, with EU law. Now, if I may just... Um, take you very briefly through my little my, 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 my background paper you'll see on pages one to three the, the rather busy the rather busy program of um, conferences, seminars and round tables that we uh, were able to uh, put on 
different different category different categories of 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 event um, conferences on broad themes such as for for instance the reviewing Maastricht seminar series which consisted of, of, of five one day seminars held between January and July 1995. Uh, we never did anything quite as ambitious as that again, um, partly because it takes quite a lot of finance. And we, were, uh, we were given £20,000 by Sweet and Maxwell um, uh, because they were going to make a publication out of it, and it turned out to be quite a nice publication. Uh, th then there were what we call round tables on, on, on particular cases, L like, for example, um, on the, the, the working time judgment, which is mentioned at the bottom of page one, um, and later on in uh, 1997, there was the um, the the workshop on, it, it no, I think we called it a, a round table, um, on order and flexibility in the European Union. And this, this it's on page, page two, if you're in the middle, middle of page two. This also, this, this, this also illustrates the fact that, that we, we, we like to collaborate with other, with other colleagues, that, um, that Round table was actually organised by by uh, Geoffrey Edwards and Eric Philippard, um, uh, political scientists, but with um, administrative support from cells, and we contributed uh, to the to the discussion. That was about that that, that was on the topic of uh, flexibility within the co within the context of the Treaty of Amsterdam. Um, we, we were also uh, fortunate, um, and I'm delighted to see Bill Allen in the in the audience. We were we were we, we were fortunate to um, have the support of Linklaters for a biennial um, uh, series of of, of lectures of, of conferences on on, on on competition law. The 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 the, the first of them. In, in, in December 1997, it's on page two, tran on transnational enforcement of competition law, a, a, a very topical subject at the time when the Commission was beginning to flex its muscles, particularly in the direction of the United States. And um, again, two years later, in December 1999, on the implementation, sorry, it's on, uh, it's, it's, I think it's on page, yes, it's on page three, on the modernization of European competition law. Um, we were very grateful for the support of, of linked letters. It meant that we could, um, we, we could invite a, 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 uh, a galaxy of, of, of international superstars to, um, to take part in the in, in in the conference, and there are also various um, collaborative um, uh, other other collaborative ac ac activities. Uh, for example, um, within the context of the Grotius project, um, uh, a, a workshop that was organised for us that was organised by by Richard. Richard Fenterman. So that just gives you a, a taste, I think, of the, of the, um, the range of, of um, the, conf the, the conference and uh, seminar and round table program that, that we were able to put on. Um, moving on to just mention the self publications. These were normally spin offs from conferences. Um, as you can see on the, on the list there on page four, there were four edited volumes, the Reviewing Maastricht volume, um, a 
volume on the principle of equal treatment in EC law, a, a volume on the general law of EC external relations, which was produced, which, um, which I edited with uh, Christophe Idion um, after I'd given up the directorship, but it was based on, um, largely based on papers which had been given um, at, a, at a conference as far back as uh, December 1995. And the future of the judicial system of the European Union, which I edited with Angus Johnston, uh, it actually came out in 2001, but the conference to which it, was re to which it related uh, took place in 1999. We also started a, an occasional paper series, which were, was re really um, for the purpose of providing an outlet for papers that were given at our round table meetings on specific, uh, usually on specific judgments or specific uh, of, of the Court of Justice or specific developments. And, and finally, of course, the, the foundation of the, the yearbook, which began to consume quite a lot of the material that previously had gone into, into um, occasional papers, which I think is why the occasional papers series began to uh, sputter out round about, round about that, that time. Um, just to mention other activities which you'll see um, on pages four to five, um, we, we established the lunchtime seminars, which were being held three times a term on, on a weekly basis during the, during the Michaelmas and, and uh, Lent terms. The Mackenzie Stewart Lecture, the first of those was given in 1997. The training program for Polish judges, which I shall come back to, and was perhaps the, the most important important outreach, if that's the right word, activity of cells uh, during that period. And finally, the, finally the Brisking Fellows, who, uh, who, who, with whom we established um, a, a, a standing relationship, and they came along and gave, gave talks and generally made themselves useful. So anyway, that, that's a, a, a bit of a review of um, activities during, um, during the five years plus one, um, the term of a cells directory is five years, but the faculty was good enough to extend um, my term for, for a further year uh, during the six years of my, of my directorship. Now, I want to move on. Um, I'm not going to be talk, by the way, I'm not going to talk for an hour and a half, as the programme might have led you to, <laughs> might have led you to fear. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope we shall, we're going to be hearing from Angela and... Um, and I, I hope that there may be questions or, or discussion um, at, at some point. But anyway, I wanted to say a little bit about the developments in EU law that were, and, and in the European Union and in EU law that were taking place at the same time, and Sill's response to these developments. Now, what you might, at what you might call the macro level, um, there were two. Uh, great developments during the 1990s. There was also a micro level, and by micro I don't mean unimportant, I just mean specific. But um, at, at the, the, the developments at the macro level were the reformation, or you might say the reimagination of the European com communities as the European Union. And the, the, other great, um, the, the other great issue was enlargement, the incorporation of the countries of Central and, and, and Eastern Europe, which was a huge challenge. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about each of those. Um, I, I probably won't say anything much about the developments at micro level. We can deal with, because I don't, as I say, I don't want to go on too long, but we can um, perhaps deal with those in, in question. I'll see how the time goes. Starting off with the 
what I'm calling the reformation of the European communities. And this, I think, helps, will, will explain the title of my talk, The End of the Golden Age. Um, golden Age is a nostalgic concept. Um, what I mean by it, meant by it was that it was the end of the original project of the EEC. Um, this reached its consummation in the internal market program, which the success of which exceeded everybody's expectations. For, for instance, it as a, as a direct result, though not an intended result, of the internal market program, the, the council that I was working for at the time began functioning in the way that it was intended to by, by, by qualified majority. When I first joined the council's legal service, voting by the council was so rare that the member of the legal service attending a council meeting was under instructions to note any occasion when voting took place so that we would be in a position to answer the questions that were regularly put to us every six months by certain British members of the European Parliament. By the end of this period, round about 1990-91, voting in the council had become so commonplace that the questions stopped coming and we stopped making a note of it. So it, it was a, of course we know that the that the internal market isn't complete, but the extent of, 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 of the success was, um, was very great. Um, and it created a kind of euphoria in Brussels. It was a, when I was there, it, it was a happy time, 80, 86 to 74, that sort of period, to 94. Uh, it, it, because we really felt that the, that the union was making progress. But um, sadly, we found once the Treaty on the European Union had been negotiated, that, that it was a bureaucratic euphoria, which hadn't, hadn't um, spread to the level of public opinion. But anyway, to come back to the, to, to the Treaty on the European Union, because this is the, bit, the, this is the turning point, this is what I mean by the end of the Golden Age. The common market is more or less complete, more or less realized what to do next. Now, everybody was united on the common market, ab ab about the common market project. The, there had, as you know, been an important treaty amendment in the form of the Single European Act of 1986, a, a negotiating process that was led by the Commission um, with the enthusiastic support of the member states. Because everybody wanted, wanted the, the single market to begin to, to work in the way that it was intended to. Maastricht was completely different. The question, what next, never got the same answer from all the member states. And they still don't really agree on um, what the shape of the union should be. At the time of the Maastricht Treaty, you probably know, there were two negotiating conferences. One was the Conference on Economic and Monetary Union, the single culture the single currency. The other had, was rather, had the rather grandiose title of the, con the Conference on Political Union. But there was no, there was no clear view of, 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 of what shape the future union should take. And it very, they're, very, they're very soon 
it, it very soon became clear that there was a split between those who wanted to confer additional competences on the European community, particularly in the fields of justice and home affairs, and what became the common foreign and security policy, the, 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 um, the political aspects of external relations. Um, there, there was a gap between those who wanted to integrate these, to, to communitarize these new policies, and those who were willing to accept that there was scope for collective action in these areas, and even institutionalized collective action, but without accepting the, co the community method, uh, commission proposal, qualified majority voting, uh, uh, involvement of the, European of the European Parliament. And that's why we ended up with the very oddly shaped uh, European Union. It, it certainly was not Nobody went into that conference, and I can tell you this because I sat through most of it. Nobody went into that conference with a blueprint that would eventually become the European Union. I think it was a bright idea of the Luxembourg presidency in, in, in the first half of uh, 1991. Um, and then it was almost derailed by the Dutch presidency, which wanted to go back to the commutatorized process with some very good footwork and a bit of, um, well, a, a, a bit of strong arming from the, the, Dutch, um, the, the, the Dutch permanent representative managed to get the Dutch government back on board towards something like the, 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 the Luxembourg um, um, the, the, the Luxembourg model, which became the European Union, um, as a kind of overarching, a kind of overarching uh, structure incorporating the three communities, but including as separately organized um, areas of collective action, justice and home affairs, and the common foreign security policy. It was a nightmare to try to teach this concept to students. But um, anyway, that was what happened. And there was a great sense of dissatisfaction at the end of the conference, so great that they set a rendezvous for 1996. They said, we must all come back and try to do better. Though by the time that negotiating conference assembled, it had become clear that elite opinion, those who wanted some kind of genuine political union, or even something as modest as the European Union that emerged from Maastricht, was running well ahead of public opinion. Uh, there were serious problems in securing the ratification of the Maastricht Treaty, the, the TEU in its Maastricht form. Um, it squeaked through in a French referendum by a very small, by a very small majority. It squeaked through in the British Parliament, I think, by one vote. And it was rejected by a referendum in Denmark. And then after a an ex very cleverly managed European Council in Edinburgh, where John Major did a played a blinder. John Major and Jean-Claude Piris together, um, they managed to get the Danes back on board with a, uh, a declaration, with a, with a decision and various declarations that would, um, <coughs> that was believed would satisfy Danish public opinion in the second referendum, and indeed it did. But that was a big shock. And so one of, one of, the, one of the objectives from then on was to try to make the European Union more user-friendly. Uh, I, I don't think it's been entirely successful, but, but certainly that was certainly what was, was, was hoped for. Um, 
But of course, also at that time, that was when the uh, Union came to the realization that enlargement was going to be needed. And that, um, that the new treaty would have to start preparing the way for this, particularly by making the institutions, uh, helping the institutions to um, function more, 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 more flexibly. So the, the objective of, the, 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 of what became the Treaty of Amsterdam was to respond to member states' dissatisfaction with the Maastricht Treaty, to respond to the evident alienation of much of public opinion from the European project, and to respond to the challenge of uh, the forthcoming enlargement. Now, that was just about the time when I was fortunate enough to be elected to my chair at Cambridge and to be appointed as director of cells. And on my fishing holiday, I worked out the, 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 um, a, 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 a plan for the reviewing Maastricht seminar. Uh, which took place in, in, in the um, first half of, of, of 1995. And we, we managed to bring together um, politicians, um, judges, Lord Mackenzie Stewart presided over some of the um, meetings, um, Lord Slindrup part, um, there were officials from the institutions, uh, UK civil servants, uh, and of course, um, leading academics. And, um, a, 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 and a large, a, quite a large number of members of, 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 of the Cambridge Law Faculty. Who I invited everyone and, and I was pleased that a, a, good, a good number uh, turned, accepted the invitation. We, we, we then, went, when we, we produced, um, a, quite a nice book, I think, which we then, um, perhaps rather um, presumptuously, we sent a copy of it to each of the, to the permanent representatives of each of the member states in Brussels. Got nice thank you letters, but um, I, have to, I have to wonder how many of them um, actually read the book. I guess they handed it over to the second secretary and said, have a quick, have a quick look at this and see whether there are any decent decent ideas in it. Well, maybe, they, maybe that did have influence, because at least some of the, some, some of the ideas um, were, were reflected, though how directly, I wouldn't like to say, in the final um, form of the, of the uh, Treaty of Amsterdam, which, which turned out to be more interesting and um, more far-reaching than many critics had expected. And it did effect effectively three important things. It, it introduced fully fledged co decision as the, uh, it wasn't yet described as the ordinary legislative procedure. Um, it was still, in fact, uh, limited to certain topics, such as internal market legislation. But nevertheless, for the first time, the European Parliament was given the status of co-legislator with, with the Council, which it hadn't got under the um, Maastricht settlement. It, it, it had a right of veto, but it didn't have to approve positively um, in the same way that the Council had to do for any uh, proposal to become law. So that was one important one important um, achievement. A, a second was the incorporation of justice and home affairs into the uh, EC treaty. They took it out of its special little um, its, its special uh, little cubby hole in um, the the TEU and brought it into what was then Title Four 
of the uh, EC Treaty. And that led, in, in part at least, to the third um, interesting, if perhaps less happy, uh, development, um, a, a significant increase in what I call primary and secondary flexibility. By, by that I mean arrangements under which uh, decisions, uh, uh, legis legislative decision making uh, need not apply uh, to all of the member states. There was already, an in there, there were already examples of primary flexibility, that is to say, fle flexibility arrangements at treaty level um, in, in respect of economic and monetary union, because um, the UK and, and Denmark um, weren't willing to go along with that. Uh, but this was uh, significantly increased in the case of um, the Treaty of Amsterdam because of the incorporation of justice and home affairs and also of the Schengen Aki. Um, the UK uh, and Denmark weren't willing to um, agree to that and um, Ireland, because of the common uh, travel area, um, had to go along with the position of the UK. So that was a, a, significant, in, in, a significant extension of um, primary flexibility. But the treaty also introduced what I call secondary flexibility, the new concept of closer cooperation, which is now called in, known as enhanced cooperation, where, un, under which the um, legislative uh, machinery of the Union can be used to adopt measures that will apply only to certain of the member states, not to all of them. So th th those were three really significant, re really significant um, consequences of the of the, um, the, tr the Treaty of Amsterdam, and um, this influenced CELS activities because we, um, uh, we, we, we had a conference, the, the one that I mentioned already that was um, organized, it was, a, I think, a round table, organized by um, Geoffrey uh, Edwards and um, the Philippard on the topic um, of, 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 of flexibility. That, that, that was in June 1997, and in July, 1997, Eric Philippa, that's right. And, and in July 1997, we had a we had a kind of reprise. We called it Maastricht Reviewed, where we invited back everyone who had participated in the 1995 seminars, and most of them came. And um, we had a very interesting uh, review. In fact, I think the the paper that we produced as a result of that was the first kind of. Uh, publicly available commentary on the, um, the Treaty of Amsterdam. So that was, that was the, 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 the those were the, the that, that was the, if you like, the reformation, the reimagination um, activity that was taking place in the um, later, later 1990s, which, and cells, um, uh, engagement with it. I, I should perhaps also mention that we undertook what we called the, the CELS Treaty Project, which was, uh, in, that was in 1997 too, which was to produce a, a, a clean version of the EC Treaty without actually amending any of the substance, um, incorporating important principles that had been developed in the case law, like primacy and direct effect. So not changing the primary law anywhere, but um, tidying it up, um, getting rid of um, treaty provisions that were effectively redundant, and making the whole thing more reliable, more readable. And that, that was published in the um, October 1997 
version of European law review, as the, as the, whole, as the whole review. Um, and I have to say, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that, although I t it was actually rather a nice little text, uh, I think it's no exaggeration to say that it had zero influence. <laughs> Anyway, that's, that's the one big, big topic. Um, and, of course, the other one was enlargement. Um, Bill has already referred to this. It was the challenge and the opportunity presented by the collapse of the Soviet Empire. It was the second occasion when the European Community Strength Union provided the answer to a geopolitical problem. Now, the great answer, the first one, was the post-Second World War um, situation where, as I've described it on previous occasions, the, the European communities provided a framework linking constitutional framework linking the warrior nations of Europe with their habitual victims in a way that would ensure, and it, it's, the success of this has been so complete that it's difficult at this time of day to appreciate it fully, uh, but it would mean that they would never go to war again. That was its first great challenge to which it responded uh, magnificently. The second was the challenge of what to do about the, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, most of which had no recent experience of democracy or of the rule of law, and whose Sovietized economies um, were very far behind those of, of, of Western Europe. The willingness of the Union to admit these countries as member states, it was a risk. It's, it's still creating problems, and it's going to go on creating problems. But I'm convinced that it was absolutely the right thing to do. You can imagine what hay President Putin would be making in the Baltic states at this time if they weren't members of the EU and of NATO. So, and I'm also very proud of the part that the UK played in this. It was always one of the main pro proponents of enlargement. And of course, it's a great sadness that, that we're now um, no longer in a position to uh, defend that open, um, that, that, that open welcoming um, uh, ethic within, within the European Union. Now, Sell's contribution to this was to this really great attainment of the Union was to was was the Polish judges training program. If I can take you back to page five of the, um, which I'm I'm in danger of going on for an hour and a half, but I'm nearly finished actually. Um, uh, it's on page five. Um, it was, I think it was a, the, the very first time and thing th that Angela and I did together was we, we trotted down to London to be in interviewed by the British Council. Um, and that I had Angela with me. I, I doubt whether I got it on my own. But anyway, um, we got the contract from the British Council to provide um, uh, legal training to members of the Polish judiciary. Um, the program ran during 1997 and 98. It was very well received, both by the British Council and by the Polish Ministry of Justice. They wanted it to continue in 1999, but unfortunately, the know-how funding was switched off by the new Labour government that wanted to redirect public money uh, to other um, in other ways, which of course was the perfect right to do. But I think 
the, the achievement during that period was substantial. Um, it involved the training, there were training sessions in Cambridge for small groups of judges and at different venues in Poland for much larger groups. And the, the, the philosophy was to train trainers, um, to, 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 to establish a kind of a core of Polish judges who would then go, be able to go on and um, provide teaching um, to their to their colleagues, and we we were able to put on this program, and it was very hard work, mainly for Angela, who was very she was always zipping back and forth to Poland, um, which is not actually a place you would go on holiday, although there were lots of nice things to do there. She she, she went there for very serious reasons, but. Um, we were helped, we had a huge support from members of the faculty, Catherine Barnard and many others, um, and from friends of the faculty like David Vaughan, who, who participated in, in, in the teaching um, at this end. But I have to say that the, uh, the success of the program was largely due to the uh, careful planning and the hard work of a person who I've described, I see in my handout, as Angel Ward. And, <laughs> and in this context, that is well said. Was it a typo? <laughs> <laughs> now, I think I have gone on long enough. So, um, I, but, but actually, before I finish on, on enlargement, I should, I, I mustn't forget to mention the immense contribution that was made also by the British Centre for English and European Studies in Warsaw, run by, largely by, 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 by Bill, which, which he carried on after I became director of cells. That too has, has had, a, had a, a, an immensely important um, educative effect on, um, uh, for, 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 for the Polish uh, profession, legal profession. I, I think I'm going to um, not talk about any of the um, sort of micro, because of the rather important micro uh, developments in EU law at the time, because I have gone on quite a long time. Um, it was a busy and enjoyable time as, as, as sales director, and I am very grateful for the support of the colleagues uh, that I had from colleagues, many of them here today. And I, I, I can't quite end without saying something about Brexit. It's almost impossible to hold a conversation uh, without, I, I find it anyway, without people, I must be becoming a bore probably, but I hardly, I mean, we mustn't be too depressed. Many of us are working hard at the moment. I don't think that Brexit can be avoided. I wish it could, and perhaps it may, but I think it's very, I think it's very unlikely. I can't see how the political conjuncture would allow it. If the Labour Party had a halfway decent leader, it might. But I'm afraid I can't see how that would happen. So I think Brexit, I think there will be a Brexit, but what we have to try to ensure is that the kind of future relationship, I mean, my, the best hope I think is for a, a, fair, a, a decent interim arrangement, which will give time to work out a longer term relationship of a kind that is sufficiently close to be able to develop into a new kind of partnership with the European Union if the Union itself develops, as I believe it will, a two-tier structure. The sad thing, of course, is that the United Kingdom could and should have been the leading state in the outer, in, 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 at the outer level of this, not I'm going to say lower, the outer of the structure. And I'd like to make sure that at some point in the future, perhaps not in my lifetime, but perhaps it will be. Thank you for your attention.
I'd say both of which um, illustrated beautifully the importance of the work that the centre has done over the last 25 years, not just in Cambridge, but in the, in, in the broader development of the European Union. Um, but now it's down to me to lay some terrain for discussion. Um, because of my contractual commitments, and not just because I work for the Prime Minister's favourite court, um, <laughs> I'm bound to say that everything that I say today is in a personal capacity, um, not in any kind of capacity that's going to represent the court. Um, but what, what I drew from the two presentations was something that sort of triggered my memory because it, it reminded me that everything that we did during that period and the period that I worked with Cell, it was, so it was, in, it was in a, an atmosphere of what I would call, describe as constructive engagement. Now, Alan and I didn't sit around the office and have a discussion about what we thought might be a, a winner or a loser or in, in terms of the sorts of projects that we were going to pursue. Rather, we would sort of come up with ideas and, and see if they ran, and we would try to, to, to build a relationship with colleagues so that colleagues would always feel as if they could come to us if they had an idea about how to develop the European aspects of their individual field. And it was a wonderful atmosphere. Everything that we did was received positively. So it wasn't just the, the efforts of people who, who were running cells that uh, led to that. It was, it was a general atmosphere of Britain is in the heart of the European Union. Um, the legal system was being Europeanized in a positive way. And Britain was influencing Europe through, through the work of people, people like, like Bill. So it, it, it was a wonderful environment to, to work in. And as they say, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. It was something that I took very much for granted. You know, the, the, what we were doing was positively received. And it was done within a general environment of the European Union being a positive element of, of, of the British legal system. So the first thing I wanted to pose is sort of a sub-question to Bill. I was very interested to hear of how your move to Cambridge was, was influential or in, essential to your move towards um, intellectual property law. I wasn't aware of that um, myself. Um, and I would, would be interested to hear to what extent your time as director was the kernel for the important work that you went on to do in, in Central Europe. Would you ever have thought of moving towards working in, in, in Central Europe if you hadn't been the sales director and hadn't been a beneficiary of this same atmosphere of, of, of positive um, engagement? So that was the, the first question. Before I put the, the, the next question on, on the table, I did want to say something about the Polish Judges Training Program and, and in particular, that had a huge impact um, in terms of the, the, the skill set, if you like, or, or, or the, the talent with which the, the Poles were able to approach um, their in, integrating EU law into their own legal system. A couple of years ago, I had an almost teary reunion with Maciek Skuna, who is the Polish Advocate General at the, at the EU court, and he came here within the rubric of that program as part of his training to become um, an EU lawyer. And he's now the Polish uh, Advocate General at the court. And, and he hasn't forgotten that part of his learning trajectory work was done here at Cambridge and through the programs that we were doing at, at CELS. So I'll now put my second question on the table to, to, to both former directors. If you were appointed director of CELS today, how would you approach the job? <laughs> I'm, taking, I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, let, let, let me contribute something about the um, teaching program to Polish students that we developed, in fact, simultaneously, or a bit before the great influx of Polish judges, which you, you, you directed. It began as an inspiration from Judge George Dobry. Some of you may have met. He's now 98, and he's still trying to direct the um, The his, his perception was 
that with Central Europe coming into completely <coughs> new sorts of relations, there must be an effort on the British side to uh, train up the next generation, in particular in their use of the English language. Uh, that was to be a major part of it. So we were to go with hired teachers um, to, to try and influence that. And more generally, to start teaching some of these universities we were coming in contact with um, about British, typically British methods of teaching law. And after 25 years, I'm delighted to report to you uh, that the University of, you see, I've got the age where I should get names. <laughs> I'm already there. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> um, is, is wanting to have us go and monitor their attempts to have interchange classes all the time and to, to pick up whatever they can. It's that city in the west of Poland. Woods. No, 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 that's east. No. Right on the border of Germany. <laughs> oh, and you don't know how to pronounce it unless you've read a book on how to pronounce it. <laughs> oh, won't come. So, uh, I didn't decide, uh, I decided not to mention all this program because it takes a lot of description and goes in various directions for this meeting. That was a deliberate decision. I'd be happy to talk about it in, in the gaps with, with anybody who's sufficiently interested because there are problems. There is a specific Brexit problem. We have run that program on finance that we have raised uh, in the course of teaching by charging fees to students in a country like Poland, where they never heard of a fee. The con consequence has been that suddenly we can't attract enough students to run the program on a basis that will will keep us, keep us going by the fundraising that we do. And if we're not careful, this, this may have to come to an end to take a really gloomy view. So, I don't think I want to say more about it. Now, what were your other questions? I what would I do? <laughs> what would you do if you were, well, what would you do if you were director, made the point of director of cells today in the current environment? How would your strategy differ from the strategy you employed in 1991-1992. Would we be worlds apart, which would make them? Uh, yes. That's obviously right. Uh, we would have to devise, devise some way, since I don't think the University of Warsaw or any other Polish university has spare money around to start paying for programs. We might be lucky, and we'd have to raise it the University of Warsaw has six foreign language programs to which students, their students can go at any one time. And that certainly makes a problem. Uh, I'm not sure I still have the energy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm preaching. I'm sure you know this already. The problem of the, the problem that I have it with the UK ADL, um, which I'm president of, the UK Association for European Law, uh, nobody is interested in anything except Brexit. <laughs> There's no point in trying to have a, a, a seminar on intellectual property law unless it's about. <laughs> the UK's participation in the patent court. You can do it on that sort of space. But it's, so I suspect I would be racking my brains to think of different, I mean, the main activity, I mean, I suppose one would want to run an activity to which one would invite as many of the same members of the government as possible, 
would be a small table. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a round table, more of them. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I, would try to, I guess I would try to do a review in Maastricht on, on what we should, you know, what sort of, what sort of um, future relationship with the European Union we should try to negotiate. And I mean, I'm doing that all the time at the moment in different sorts of ways, but uh, I think I'd probably do that. Now the floor is open. Um, I want to make um, a comment because um, I, I, as you were speaking of them, I remember being here on October the 6th of 1992 and listening to Lord Slid, and I do remember being present in your five seminars in Maastricht. And you have concentrated on what CELS has done and talk about the faculty, but at that time, we didn't have blogs every time you opened your computer on what was going on. We probably had one official European lawyer for each law school in the country. And we had very few people, that was a lucky one, who had any experience of actually working in a European institution. Because in fact, the, in the 80s, the academics moved from academia, many of them, to go and take nice, interesting jobs in the European Commission. So one of the things you did do, um, and I'm talking about this period, was actually to go wider than Cambridge. You know, my links, personal links with Cambridge are very limited, but you invited young academics to come from other universities to attend the seminars, the mass trips. And I still remember, um, it, you know, in these, in these seminars, Alan invited uh, people who were actually were well present in those discussions, and it was all uh, openly discussed. And I never, as a reasonably young academic, to be actually shocked that the treaty amendment on Maastricht was done and finally agreed at 4 a.m. <laughs> when everybody was tired. And that was the reason why it didn't make sense. <laughs> because the word, no, there was nobody, because I, I thought that treaties would have been given to a, a committee of experts to check the wording, to, to, to come up with consistency. So that kind of um, opportunity to find out how the real thing works was not so easily available to a, at that time and was narrowed a long way from all of England. So I think there is an aspect about sales, it's out of reach, not just the judges, etc., but particularly the, the young academics at the time, which I'm very grateful for. Well, thank you very much for talking. <laughs> there must be more. Yeah. Uh, well, to pick up on, on, on some of the things which uh, Angela was saying, uh, do you think, looking back in a way, of where we are now, we didn't get, there wasn't enough attention given to the democratic deficit, is often the, the, the phraseology, but the gap between popular understandings, which I think now with the internet we see only audio clearly in the sort of comments uh, underneath lots of videos and lots of, you know, the quite vitriolic, very extreme antagonism. I realize that's more of a political science issue in some sense, but it does have a strong legal aspect. Do you think, in retrospect, there wasn't enough attention over the decades, including itself, given, given to If you like, shall I be I'm not sure that it was, that the problem lay with the democratic deficit. I, I, I think it, it lay more with the political class in, in, in all countries that would never come clean of their electorate about what was happening. I mean, what, 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 one of the reasons I was told, this may not be true, it sounds a bit apocryphal, but what, one of the reasons I was told why there was a substantial negative vote in France on the European Constitution was because the government made the mistake of sending a copy of the treaty of the, of the Constitution, the draft Constitution, to every household in France. And people realized for the first time that actually there was freedom of movement and um, that you weren't allowed to discriminate in favor of goods produced by your own country. Now, I did. That may be a problem. 
But my, my, my view is that in none of the member states, certainly not in this one, but I don't think any, in any of the member states, except possibly those where people don't have an awful lot of confidence in their own government, such as Belgium and Italy. Um, I don't think governments have come clean with, the, with, with, the, with, with their electorates about what the Union was really about. Um, and so I think that's, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it, it's part of the loss of, it, 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 it's an aspect of the general loss of confidence in, 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 in political representatives in, in, in Western Europe. Um, I mean, as far as the democratic deficit is concerned, I, mean, I don't think there is a deficit anymore. You know, we have a, 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 a directly elected European Parliament which legislates with the Council. It has co-legislative power. No piece of legislation can become law except for implementing stuff which the Commission does, um, can, can become law without the agreement of the European Parliament. The trouble is the Parliament doesn't have a proper, a normal political relationship with its electorate. I mean, no member of the European Parliament, I'm pretty sure, owes his or her prospects of being re-elected to anything that he or she has done in the European Parliament. And, you know, it's, now, that's not a democratic deficit that, that we as lawyers can, can, can remedy because actually we've done that already. There's, there's quite a well-articulated uh, system of, 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 of democratic accountability in the union now at two levels, the level of the parliament and the level of the council. But it, it, it's the failure of the politicians who engage in their electorate explain what's going on, and present them, particularly for members of the European Parliament, to present themselves as members of the Parliament and not supporters of the Labour Party who happen to be working in Strasbourg, uh, supporters of the Conservative Party who, who happen to be reluctant to work in Strasbourg, because they'd much rather be Western. Um, so I think that's, and it's not an easy one to remedy. And you know, that's why the French are perfectly key, uh, were perfect, absolutely candid at the time of, of our referendum, the, 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 the recent referendum. They'd never have been so stupid as to ask that question of their electorate. Because they might easily have got that the, the wrong answer themselves. Um, so, better stop there before I start on David Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, as, as an EU citizen who has been living in this country for more than 15 years, I must admit, um, I've always run into people in, in pubs and elsewhere who thought I wanted to pick a fight when I said, I'm an academic EU lawyer. Um, so I'm not, I'm actually not at all surprised about uh, the, the, the narrow rector, if, if anything, my wife said, oh, look, Marcus, you know, 48% 10 years ago, it would have been, you know, 22% uh, in favor of the European Union. So 48 is, is probably good innings. I have a question on the court. The court seems to be in political circles, the, the sort of lightning rod, and uh, I think now that we see the, sh the attention shifting from the Luxembourg Court to the UK Supreme Court, I, I fear for the, for the judges uh, in the UK because I think the same wrath of political unhappiness uh, that uh, the court in Luxembourg has faced for decades will now descend on the UK Supreme Court because there will be judgments that are not finding in favor of the political class. So do you see a role for cells to communicate what law actually, what role law judging judges play in society um, going forward? Not just <laughs> 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 I'm going to comment that, that Mo just spoke the, the, the course, questions. Course. I do have a regret 
go back to your question, but it's related to, to this question as well. I do regret not suggesting a seminar on the role of the press and truthful reporting in the in, in the maintenance of, of contemporary democracy. Because one thing that I remember about working here is that I would start my tutorials on EU law with the, the remarkably long, with the following lines, is that when I teach anything all around the world, I always say to the students and look out for current developments, you know, in this particular field um, while we're studying the material. But here I would start with, don't repeat anything that you read in a newspaper <laughs> in your exam because it might not be right. And the way that it was dealt with in those days was sort of just sort of treated as a bit of a joke, you know, I really cares about what the Daily Mail says, you know, it doesn't matter, it's never going to have any impact. And um, experience that we had when I was working with Advocate General Nilo Yaskinen, he um, was the Advocate General in a case called FOA or, or Caltop, and it was the first time that the EU court had to deal with the question of whether or not discrimination on the basis of obesity is discrimination on the basis of disability. Now, this is an issue that's gone around the Supreme Courts around the world, okay? These, something that's been repeated in a number of different jurisdictions, and he wrote the opinion in the Kaltoff case. And I'll get to where the UK media comes in a minute, because I happened to be at that hearing, okay? I was there. And um, I've also read the very carefully put together press release that was done by our um, press information centre. And what was interesting about the Kaltoff case was that no one was alleging that he couldn't do his job. That was not part of the case. And he would have had to have been, you know, deaf, dumb, blind, you know, completely disconnected with what went on in that courtroom and what was put in the press release, not to understand that. That's what was interesting about the case, okay? This was a, a, a job, he was a child minder, so it was a job that traditionally done by, by women, a panel of three women decided he was the person that had to go, he was a different person, he was the big guy, okay? That's what was interesting about the case. Daily Mail reports after Mr. Yaskinen writes his, his opinion, with fetching photograph of Mr. Yaskin, and that's the, the, the judges, you know, and I think general haven't been previously exposed to that level of exposure. With photograph, European top European court advisor uh, threatens UK jobs, um, obese people who can't do their jobs, okay, are now able to sue. Okay, so if you put in it on the internet, Yaskin and a Daily Mail, you can read it read it for yourself, but the reporting was antithetical, actively antithetical to what that, to what that case was about. If these issues are going to be now completely, you know, decided by the UK, UK Supreme Court, is the UK Supreme Court going to be subjected to, the, to, 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 to this sort of leading, misleading um, reporting? I don't know. The boundaries have all, all gone down now, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of, of lack of truth in, 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 in reporting. Um, and again, du during the, the thing that frustrated me personally during the Brexit campaign was the BBC. Mm -hmm. And the BBC just being derelict in its public duty um, and, and reporting and, and, re -re and re repeating lies. And, um, I, you know, both myself and, and colleagues I spoke with just couldn't understand, well, somebody stop them. You know, so does something need to be done in this country about um, better enforcement of truth um, in, in reporting mass media? I should just confess that one gap I think in our program over the five, six years was economic and monetary union. We didn't actually have a seminar. And it's odd. But I think we are, we need to think about it. The, the, the reason for it, I think, is that lawyers were terrified of society. It was very difficult to find anybody to come to court. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, that is a subject which I mean, was already poorly understood, even though, of course, the, the UK has always been opted out. But um, though I think there was a moment in the Blair government when it might have been possible. In the first, in the first Blair government, when it might have been possible for the UK to, because Blair had done anything, 
I believe that he was talked out of it by Brown. And I'm about the last person in the United Kingdom, left in the United Kingdom, who wishes that we had been part of this. <laughs> <laughs> John wanted to make a comment? Just to say how much I agree with what you said about the untruthfulness of our press and the astonishing damage that it does, mm. and the bias. Um, and what can be done about it? I saw this very much in the context of the EU and criminal law and the, the Juris Project, which I'm mm. presenting this afternoon. One small example which shocked me in a New Year's party in our street, we were talking to a neighbour about the floods disastrous floods in the northwest, which had happened on Boxing Day, America, and she was saying, of course it's all because the EU won't let us dredge our rivers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you laughed. I looked that out. I'd forgotten whether it was the Sun or the Daily Mail or the Express which had first published that, but the other two had immediately copied it. I then looked on the Commission's Euromiss website, where, of course, they picked the story up, they said what the truth was, and they say how many hits there have been on each thing on the site. I think it was 2,401 and 2,402 after I looked. <laughs> think what the combined circulation or readership of the three tabloid newspapers is. I think their combined sales would have been about four million, and there would have been online readers, and um, people would read, more than one person would read, probably six, seven, eight million people have read that story, of whom a great many believed it, mm -hmm. and the same all the way through. We, our press, if it's mendacious about individuals, is rightly terrified of our libel laws, because it will get hit, probably, even though it's terribly expensive to do it. If they publish completely false information about institutions, nothing happens. At least the BBC is under a charter which requires it to try to be truthful with the same as it applies to newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, slightly off the tangent, I'll say something Mark has said. In 2015, I had to give lectures and lectures in in the University of England of Bruxelles about, um, and I gave one on the Britain and European criminal justice, basically. And I looked at that point on what opinion polls in this country said about public opinion on the being good or bad in the community. And if you look at the sensible ones for neutral bodies like YouGov, Public opinion was then running at about 60% in favour of staying. No doubt Cameron went those and decided to do this kind of um, election. Then if you looked at the looked at the, po the political complexion of the newspapers, it was about 80% anti EU. And of course, things like the Daily Telegraph is saying 98% of the public want that, and so on. And look through the campaign leading up to the referendum, um, they went in, uh, in absolutely megaphone mode against um, the EU. And Cameron and Osborne, to their great discredit, completely failed to make the case for remaining in. Essentially, Cameron's campaign amounted to, look, we hate those bastards as much as you do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be expensive to me. <laughs> okay, we have one more minute, so I'm going to be very greedy. Bill, do you have any, any comments you want to say? I'm sorry I didn't reply to you when you were... Uh, hazarding this court full of uh, non-understanders. It's partly because the wondrous world of patents is now beginning to receive remarkably different views, led as far as one can tell by the one judgment 
of Lord and Hugh um, in the Ella, um, Eli Lilly case, which was decided now some, some months ago. Uh, but that signaled and brought all the other members of the Supreme Court into line with him for a new approach which really favours the German and Dutch view of a particular point. I won't start to go into it um, in those circumstances because they think that they must adapt in ways that they're still exploring. And I imagine we would want that process to go some distance before we say, no, you're not doing us any good. Well, one thing I, I would say is that you can be certain that counsel will go on citing judgments of the Court of Judgments on aspects of EU law that owe their origin. Of, of, of the UK law that owe their origin to the EU, on, on, including, I would expect, on post, post exit judgments. Um, because, of course, courts want to hear that kind of thing. And the, the Court of Justice will have at least, and at least as much persuasive authority as an, an American or a Canadian court. Okay, so we're now on time. Um, I would like to close by first of all thanking both speakers for uh, wonderful presentations and perhaps closing with a thought that might be relevant for discussion this afternoon. Something that I thought was also left out of the, of the, the Remain campaign was globalism. If you're going to have globalism, you've got to have institutions to manage it mm -hmm. of, of, of some kind. And um, how is, is cells? placed to perhaps make a contribution to the development of EU law in that context. Is there a sunny path that we might be able to, to find in the afternoon session? So thank you to both speakers and thank you to the participants.